Hi, I'm Linda Sparks and I'm here at the Farthingale's Needle Art Studio and I'd like to share a bit of information with you about corset hardware. And when I say hardware, I'm talking about busks, bones, that kind of thing. So let's get started with busks. Busks were invented and developed in the 1830s and they enable you to get into and out of your corset alone without help. They go in the front of the corset and they're basically a clasp. So this is a basic corset busk. There's two sides. One has loops, one has knobs. The important thing to know is that the loops always go in the right hand side of the corset. So on the right hand side of the body of the person who's wearing the corset. So the loops go in the right hand, knobs go on the left hand side, and one goes over the other. That's a basic opening busk. This is a diamond busk. There's little diamonds in the knobs of the busk. And so it's great for a bridal corset or an evening wear corset. And you can see here that one of the loops is behind the busk. And that just keeps the busk from coming apart when it's in a drawer or on a table. It's not that it's broken, it just secures it. But when you're wearing the busk in a corset, it will of course be over top of the knob. So we have the diamond bust. This is a black one. So you can see that there, there's a black finish to these uh, corset loops. They're shiny black, so gunmetal. Again, it's just a design feature. They're as functional as any other busk. These ones are gold. This one's antique brass. And you can see that there's two, knob, two loops closer to the bottom on this busk. When they're closer together, that's always the bottom of the busk. And you will always see that it will be at the bottom if this is in your right hand. That gives a little bit of extra support over your tummy, over your belly. So antique brass, gold, black, and diamond. And then of course just the regular busk. Now a very special busk is this one. I'm not sure how well you can see that, but if you look at these loops, they're engraved. So it's a very pretty busk. It's a much more expensive busk because it's had that process done to it. There's engraving of a pattern and then a paint was rubbed into that. So it's a very uh, interesting feature. And historically, many of the busks did have engraving on the loops. So again, you can see loops are in the right hand, knobs are on the left hand. Now, just before I go further, a uh, busk should flex. It shouldn't bend, so I should be able to flex it. And if when I flex it, it stays bent, then it's not a very good busk. Because what's going to happen is when you wear the corset with the busk in it, the busk will stay bent after you sit down. But you do want it to be flexible because that's what allows it to flex over your tummy and around your chest. So the flexibility is important. Unless, of course, you're wanting something that's really straight. This is a wide busk. It's still flexible, but it's not as flexible as any of the other busks. Partly because it's wider and partly because it's made of a different type of steel. Still, there are loops and knobs. Loops always go in the right hand side, knobs always go on the left. Without question, it's always the same. And again, I've just got one behind the busk here in order to hold it together as I'm demonstrating. So that's a wide bust. And when you'd use that is if you're working on a corset for a larger person um, that needs a lot of support. So a large, larger corset or a man's corset. This is a spoon busk, And you can see it's shaped like a spoon. Now, quite often when I'm at a trade show, people will pick this up and go, oh, it goes this way. It doesn't. The spoon, the bowl of the spoon, it goes around your stomach. So it curves around your stomach, hugging your stomach and tucking in at the bottom. And the handle of the spoon goes up between the breasts. So that's a spoon busk. And a spoon busk is historically accurate to the late 1800s. 
It's much more expensive because it's much more shaped. It is still flexible, but it is more rigid. And really, people are usually using it if they're doing historic reproduction. Prior to the 1830s, busks did not open, but they did exist. They used to be a piece of wood, a piece of ivory, often engraved. Now you can use a wide bone. So that's a light bone. It's very flexible. This is a chrome steel bone. You can't drill a hole through it. You can't really bend it, but it's perfect for a non-opening busk for corsets prior to uh, the 1830s. You can also use it in a, in a contemporary corset as well. So that is it for busks, and we'll move on to boning. Every corset needs to have boning. If it doesn't have boning, it's really not a corset. And there's so many types of boning to choose from, it's sometimes difficult to know which is the right boning. I typically get asked the question, what is the perfect boning for the corset? And there is no perfect boning. In fact, in my opinion, a corset, the best corsets have a, a selection of boning in them. So it's important to know the characteristics of the boning available so that you know which boning is going to be the right boning for your project. I'm going to start with spiral boning. Spiral boning is the boning that most people are aware of. It looks like a flattened spring and it's gray. Not sure if you can see the details of that, but it can flex forward and backward and sideways. And that's what makes this boning really special. Most boning can go forwards and backwards, but not sideways, and this can. So it can go into princess seams of a dress or of a jacket to give some support. It can be used in doublets, it can be used in bone bodices, it can be used in modern day dresses just to keep the fabric where it needs to stay and keep it from wrinkling up. This is quarter inch spiral bone, it's fairly lightweight. There's also 7 16 inch spiral bone and it's actually easier to see the details of that boning. Again, forward, backward, and it can go side to side. So it's really quite an amazing boning. It's, it's quite flexible. Being quite flexible means that it's not giving you the same support that a rigid boning would, but it also means that you can dance in this corset. You could put it in a ballet corset or a ballet bodice. You can put it into um, pretty much anything where there's going to be movement required. If you'll notice the ends of these, they haven't been capped. You can buy them in pre-finished lengths, but if you cut them yourself, you'll have a little, you add the caps. And in another video, I'll be showing you how to secure these tips to the bones. And these are called U-tips, and they come in various sizes. This boning is six millimeter. This is 7 sixteenths of an inch, and it also comes in a smaller size four millimeter. And that's more for if you're wanting to put two bones or three bones or even four bones side by side. But again, you get flexibility and support. And these come in pre-tipped, so uh, you can get them in finished, finished lengths uh, every half inch. So from, I think, four inches right through to 20 inches. You need to buy the tips to go on them if you're going to cut it. So these two pieces were um, cut from long coils. If you're going to cut this, you need a bolt cutter or something with a sharp edge. And when you cut it, you're cutting one side of the wire and then the other side of the wire. Don't try to cut all the way across. Just cut one wire and the other wire and the tip will fall off. White bones. White bones are the next most common Bone. And they're called white bones because they're white. But they're actually also called spring steel bones because they're made of spring steel. And the important thing about spring steel is the fact that it always wants to spring back into its original shape. So it doesn't bend out of shape easily. And again, like a busk, it should flex, but when I flex it, it should not stay bent. So it flexes. 
but it doesn't stay bent. And you will see that there are some white bones on the market that when you bend them, when you flex them, they stay bent, and those are not good bones. So this is a pre-finished six millimeter bone. This is a pre-finished eight millimeter bone. And this is a pre-finished 11 millimeter bone. So how do you choose? A lot of that depends on the support that you need and how big the body is. Proportionately, you usually use a wider bone for a larger corset and a narrower bone for a smaller corset, just regarding proportion. But the six millimeter bone is actually very thick. It's thicker than the 11 millimeter. So it will give you a lot of support. The eight millimeter is sort of a mid-range bone. When you're looking at boning and you're trying to decide, I would suggest always having a selection. Buy them from a few different companies, label them with where they're from and which bone it is, and keep them in a, in a mug or something. So that you have a project coming up, you can see which bone is the type of bone that you need and then you can order that quality. These bones also come, as you can see, that's been pre-cut by the meter. So if you're doing a lot of corsets, you might want to buy this on the coil and you can then use the same kind of tips that you use on the spiral boning. The exact same U-tips can be used to finish this boning as finish the spiral boning. So white bones are known as spring steel bones. They should be springy, flexible, but not bend. And they come in various sizes. And the wider ones are used more for larger corsets, smaller ones for smaller corsets. One thing is, these bones, my quarter inch bones, the really strong ones, I always use them in the back of a corset. Uh, on either side of the grommets, because it supports the, the stress on the grommets, and I think that's really important. Spiral bones, if they're used down the back of a corset, your back can get distorted as the corset is worn. This will keep the back of your corset nice and straight, and it adds back support, which is an extra bonus. Now, I've shown you these little tips, and they're called U-tips, or bone tips. And the big one shows the details the best. The little one is the same. Farthingale sells these in aluminum. And because they're aluminum, it means they're soft. And if they're soft, they're easy to apply. And you can apply them with two sets of pliers. There's crimping at the bottom, and that crimping is important. Because as you squish the, the tips to fit the bone, that crimping is already there, and it takes up the extra sort of naturally, and it's not as bulky when it. So you're looking at aluminum bo bone tips with a little crimping around the bottom, and that will make setting of these bone tips the simplest. So there, there they are. Most sites don't say that they're aluminum. Go with the website that says these are aluminum bone tips. And I know Farthingale's bone tips are aluminum uh, because we make sure of that. If they're steel, it will be virtually impossible to apply them to a bone. And in a future video, I will be showing you and demonstrating how to apply these bone tips. I'm going to move on to plastic boning now. And we often think that plastic boning is no good for corsets, and that's actually not true. But I will say that the boning you buy in an average fabric store is not a good choice for corsets. The boning that I have here is actually designed for corsets. So it is plastic boning, and maybe we should use the word synthetic boning, and it won't be quite so offensive. Plastic boning, or in this case, German plastic boning, synthetic boning, this is so, you can sew through it. So we sometimes think, well, if you can sew through it, it can't be strong, but it is incredibly durable. And in fact, when you look at it the first time, you're going to think, I can't sew through that, but give it a try on some scrap. It comes in five millimeter, which is used, we sell more of this for the millinery trade than for the corset trade, but we do have people buying it for doll corsets. Seven millimeter, which is provided in some of our corset kits and is used a lot. We sell about mm, 
seven to 8,000 meters of this a year to corset makers. You can see it's slightly striped. You can cut the ends with scissors. You can round them if you want. So if I had scissors, I could just cut that to a point. I could cut it round. I can use a file to take the corners off. And again, I can sew through it. It is um, a type of polyester, but you can dye it. So if you, you were able to dye polyester, you can dye these bones. This is the 11 millimeter, and the stripes are more obvious, and there's 13 millimeter. So you can see there's different widths, and it is remarkably, it is flexible, but it doesn't bend and stay bent. It will come back. As these warm up, they start to take the shape of your body. Some corset makers really like that, some don't. So uh, again, it's a matter of personal choice. And that is German plastic whalebone. There's also um, simply plastic whalebone. It's white. It can't be sewn through. So it's a synthetic whalebone. And so the idea was that it would mimic original whalebone. But the original whalebone is much more like the spiral boning in that it can wiggle in different directions. So this can be cut with scissors. Um, I find using tin snips is better. And it cannot be sewn through, and that's really important to remember. Uh, if you try to sew through this, you will break a needle. I sell about 5,000 meters of this a year. So clearly, there are people who appreciate working with it. And it comes in a thicker one too, but it's narrower but thicker, and this is not so good for corset bowing. We sell this mostly to a company that does uh, really interesting theatrical installations. So it does exist, but it's not a good choice for corset making. You can see it's really, really thick. I'm not sure if you can see that. So it's very difficult to blunt the ends, they tend to stay really sharp. So this is plastic whalebone. The striped is German, German plastic boning. And the striped you can sew through, the solids you can't. But both of these have been engineered for corsets, so they're both a good choice. And by using these, you don't need to buy any special tools because you can use scissors. So you've probably all heard of Rigeline. Rigeline was a woven plastic boning, and that's what this is. And woven plastic boning tends to fray. So there's all little bits on the ends, and then you get pricklies. I'm not sure if you can see that. I can do it with the white one better. Okay. So you get all these little prickly ends. They prickle you through the corset. They prickle and poke through the fabric. And this boning bends really easily. It's not a good choice for corsets. It just isn't. So if I can bend it that easily, it's not a choice for corsets. You may want to put this in a boned bodice for a gown that you're wearing over your corset, but I wouldn't use it for a corset. There are little ends now that come and fit over them. So it protects them. The, the little pricklies won't work through there. And you can sew through this boning and you can throw, sew through the cap. So it's, it's great that way. Really, it's a creative piece. You can use it for a lot of different things, but I would not use woven boning or anything like Rigeline for a corset. So I'm showing it to you here just because I want you to know not to use it but that it does exist and it does have its purposes. And that's it for boning. I'm going to move on now to hooks and eyes and other closures. So I've talked about busks as a closure. And busks are the best choice for a closure in my opinion, and they are the most traditional choice. The reason they're the best is because they've got this steel down either side. So it makes it very uh, a very rigid front and it makes it easier to do the busk up because it's got this steel. But some people like to use hook and eyes, and that's okay. You can still slide a bone behind the hooks and eyes. But if you're going to use a hook and eye, you want to use something like this. These are riveted. 
So they're riveted into tape. And that's important because it means that they're very secure. They're, uh, they're riveted into the tape. If this is sewn in properly, these hooks and eyes should last. They're also very big, they're not small. So there's hook and eye tape that you can use and that's just sort of a regular riveted hook and eye tape. It's fairly large. This is the sewn in type of hook and eye tape. So you've got stitching down which secures the hooks and eyes between two layers of fabric. And they then go in like that. So again, depending on how you sew them in, that can be very strong. But you do still want to have a bone behind them just to give that extra security. And that way you don't have pressure on one grommet over another. It helps distribute the stress on the front or the back of the corset. Now this next item is unique. It's called alternating hook and eye tape, and it's actually made from what is called corset hooks and corset eyes. And you can see there's a hook and an eye and a hook and an eye. It alternates. Now when I was working in theater, we used to have to sew these hooks on by hand in the same formation, alternating. And I'll hook that on there and that on there. <clears throat> now the importance of alternating hook and eye tape is in dance costumes, so specifically in something like ballet. When the dancer is moving a lot, if you've used hook and, hook and eyes that are just ordinary hook and eyes, it's very easy for them to come undone. With the alternating, it's almost impossible for them to come undone. In fact, it's even difficult for a dresser to get you in and out of this, but it means that you've got a bodice on that's very secure. So that is an alternative and it is very secure. So you might want to consider this for a ballet bodice or any kind of dance bodice where there's a lot of movement that there'd be risk of the bodice coming undone. So there you go. And again, if it's sewn on properly, you still do should have a bone down behind these in order so that there's not more stress on one than another and it just distributes, the bone distributes the stress. This is a corset, uh, a corset hook. So this has really come into being a corset clasp since the steampunk movement started. And it's two pieces with a little lock. There's a knob piece and there's a hook piece. And these are attached to corset with rivets. So there's little holes here and you rivet that to the corset and you rivet the other side to the corset and when you put the corset on this slides over one side that slides down and your corset is securely uh, locked together and you might have two or three of these down the front of a corset so they're not just a fashion piece they are functional and there are uh, you do have to measure and I will be doing another video on how to apply these corset swing hooks at a later date. But there you can see what it looks like and how it functions. And it's just one other way to close a corset. So we have the swing hook, we have the busk, and we have hooks and eyes as three different methods to close a corset. And that concludes the section on hardware here at Farthingale.